1981 and 1982, a string of sexual assaults were committed in Vancouver, BC. Late at night, the perpetrator broke into women's ground floor or basement apartments and assaulted them at knife point. He told victims he was looking for someone who had ripped him off or who owed him money. The perpetrator would pull a turtleneck over his face to disguise himself, and he was a stranger to all of the victims. Police figured that these assaults were likely committed by one man due to similarity in modus operandi. They began their search for who they called the rip-off rapist. Around the time that these assaults began, serial killer Clifford Olson was on a murderous spree in Vancouver that left at least 11 children and young adults dead. Following his apprehension, Olson cut a deal with the RCMP for his wife to receive $10,000 in exchange for his disclosure of the location of each of the bodies. His wife was paid a total of $100,000, which was appalling to the public. Following this deal, the Vancouver police faced significant pressure to improve the public's confidence in the law enforcement system. Public pressure to convict is one of several predisposing circumstances which are known to foster wrongful convictions. According to Bruce McFarlane, public pressure causes police to become impatient and less willing to admit that their proposed solution may be wrong. The increasing pressure on the Vancouver Police Department facilitated what McFarlane calls a curative mission in the search for a viable suspect in the ripoff rapist assaults. The need to find the perpetrator as quickly as possible reduced their investigation from a careful, objective survey of multiple suspects to a desperate search for anyone who fit the description. Ivan Henry, later found to be innocent of the assaults, was the person police focused in on. A number of psychological, institutional, and societal factors led the police to narrow in on this innocent man. It can be said that Ivan Henry lived on the margins of society. He was a high school dropout and lived in a number of abusive homes as a child. He also had a criminal record for drug trafficking, property crimes, and an attempted rape conviction which carried a five-year sentence. He fit the criminal label and was already on the radar of law enforcement. In 1980, he moved to Mount Pleasant in Vancouver, BC with his common-law wife and two daughters, so he was new to the area. He did not have a steady job, but rather worked temporary construction jobs and pawned clothes and microwaves. Being marginalized in a variety of ways made him an easy target for the police to suspect. One of the things that put Ivan Henry on the police radar was his wife's statement to police. She accepted an offer of $1,000 for information leading to the arrest of the attacker. According to CTV News, she stated to police, Ivan told me recently that he had been ripped off on a couple of drug deals. He's been going out around midnight or later and coming home around 4 a.m. He carries a knife in the car with him all the time. The use of paid informants is a controversial aspect of the criminal justice system. When a monetary incentive is involved, the accuracy of information given is put into question. One of their daughters claimed that the mother's statement was a lie motivated by money to sustain her drug habits. Regardless, it was taken by the police as true and helped them in making their arrest of Ivan Henry. Henry was arrested on May 12, 1982. Misconduct was evident in the police lineup procedures and played a significant part in Henry's wrongful conviction. Eleven victims viewed a physical lineup in which Henry clearly stood out as the prime suspect. Others in the lineup were police officers dressed in plain clothes, and most of them had strikingly different hair color and facial structure. It was set up in a way that would make it unreasonable for the victims to identify anyone other than Ivan Henry. Henry realized how unfair the lineup was and refused to participate, but one of the officers restrained him long enough for a photo to be taken, while the others watched and laughed. Although Henry was unfairly centered out in the lineup, the victim's identification of him was far from conclusive and they could not charge him at the time. Instead of looking for a new suspect, Tunnel Vision drove the police to continue pursuing Henry tapping into his phone and putting him under surveillance. Even when their surveillance of Henry failed to catch the next attack, investigators continued to believe that Henry was responsible and put his photo in a photo lineup for the most recent victim on July 27, 1982. This array of photos was just as biased as the original lineup. Henry's photo stood out from the rest, showing him in front of a jail cell with a uniformed police officer in the foreground, while the backgrounds of the other photos were neutral or blank. Henry was visibly 10 years older than the other lineup members, and the only one with a mustache and curly hair. From this lineup, the victim tentatively identified Henry as her attacker, which allowed the police to arrest him again. It is clear from these lineup procedures that the police were experiencing tunnel vision. They had already made their decision that Ivan Henry was guilty. 
they failed to pursue more likely suspects such as Don McRae, who had a history of late night sexual predatory behavior, including criminal charges for trespassing and breaking and entering. They kept trying to arrest Henry, although there was a lack of evidence against him. Tunnel vision originates in cognitive biases, but is reinforced by institutional pressures, such as the need for a public relations win after the Clifford Olson murders. In addition, tunnel vision and noble cause corruption are mutually reinforcing. For example, the belief that Henry was guilty made it desirable to manufacture unfair lineups that pointed to him, and also justified it in the mind of the police officers. Henry was charged with 17 counts of rape, attempted rape, and indecent assault. Ten of those counts proceeded to trial. The trial lasted only 12 days, and the jury deliberated quickly. Ivan Henry was guilty on all counts. He was also declared a dangerous offender and sentenced to an indefinite time period. Henry sent letters to various courts and justice ministers seeking to overturn his conviction. He made more than 50 applications, all of which were denied. In 2002, police began investigating a group of 25 unsolved sexual attacks which occurred between 1983 and 1988. This was called Project Smallman. The modus operandi was identical to that of the rip-off rapist attacks, but Henry couldn't have been responsible for these attacks as he was in jail at the time. Some of these attacks were linked by DNA evidence to Don McRae in 2004, who had been tailed by police in the 1980s. Don McRae pled guilty to three offenses in 2005 and got a sentence of five years in prison. The similarity between the two sets of assaults was brought to the attention of the Criminal Justice Branch of the Provincial Ministry of the Attorney General. The branch appointed Special Prosecutor Len Douse to investigate this matter, and he found that there had likely been a miscarriage of justice in Henry's conviction. Henry was finally freed in 2009 pending appeal, and in 2010 he was acquitted of all counts. According to Justice Lowe, who gave reasons for the appeal court, the miscarriage of justice was largely due to poor eyewitness testimony and judicial bias and indiscretion. The single most prevalent factor in wrongful convictions is eyewitness misidentification. Most of the Crown's case against Ivan Henry was based on false identification by victims. Justice Lowe quoted an observation from a 1997 Ontario Court of Appeal case in which Judge Doherty suggests concerns about the reasonableness of a verdict arise especially when the person identified is a stranger to the witness, circumstances are not conducive to an accurate identification, pre-trial identification processes are flawed, and there is no other evidence to support or confirm the identification. All of these factors were present in the Henry case. All of the attacks occurred in the dark, and some victims had their eyes closed or were not wearing their necessary eyeglasses. Each victim had only limited opportunity to record to memory the features of her attacker. Some victims identified other men than Harp as the perpetrator. For example, one victim saw a man on the bus who she thought was her attacker, and others changed their minds when it came to identification in the police lineups. This information concerning the inconsistency of the witness identification was not presented at trial. It is also important to notice that the majority of the victims went from being somewhat sure that Henry was their attacker on the date of the lineup to being absolutely certain by the time the case went to trial. One explanation for this occurrence is the post-identification feedback effect. Except in the case of a double-blind procedure, the police officers who conduct a lineup are immersed in the investigation and have knowledge about the prime suspect. The subjective view that they bring to the identification process can influence the victim's perspectives. Since the police at the time were adamantly pursuing Henry as a suspect, it is possible that they gave positive feedback to the victims following what they perceived to be a correct identification. A study by Bradfield, Wells, and Olson found that when someone receives information that their eyewitness identification was correct, they are likely to have inflated perceptions about how certain they were of that identification. The fact that the witness's certainty increased over time is significant because jurors tend to be more willing to accept eyewitness testimony as accurate if the witness appears convinced. Witnesses can have honest intentions and be fully convinced in the accuracy of their identification, but still be mistaken. This is why juries need to make a judgment of the honesty of the witness and a judgment of the correctness of their identification, based on circumstances and other evidence. Other aspects of the identification process were problematic. One witness testified that she was hypnotized by a police detective at the police station. Research on the effect of hypnosis on eyewitness identification is mixed. 
One study found that hypnosis had no significant effect on recall of information or accuracy of identification in an eyewitness identification task. Another found that hypnosis actually decreased accuracy on eyewitness recall and recognition tasks and that hypnotized subjects were more susceptible to misleading information. The extent to which we can rely on the testimony of a person under hypnosis is unclear. Much of the identification in the Henry case was based on voice recognition. A review of research conducted by Clifford found that the highest estimates of ear witness reliability are fairly low. Intraspeaker variability is almost as large as interspeaker variability due to alterations over time in musculature, physiological, and psychological states. Ear witnesses and eyewitnesses are equally prone to error. One study by Clifford found that the accuracy of voice identification was 50% after one week, 43% after two weeks, and 9% or only chance level after three weeks. This fits in with other research that suggests that greater delay equals poorer performance. This is the same with eyewitness testimony. One of the victims was attacked on May 5, 1981 and identified Henry as her attacker on the basis of similarity in voice on May 12, 1982, just over one year later. It is unreasonable to assume that her identification of a voice would be accurate after that amount of time. Overall, the testimony of the victim should have been seriously questioned at trial, not because of dishonesty, but because of the multiplicity of factors that hindered their ability to make an accurate identification. Perhaps the main reason that eyewitnesses were not effectively cross-examined was because Henry represented himself at trial with virtually no legal experience. He had dismissed his defense lawyers, first John White and second Richard Peck. He believed they could have been part of a conspiracy to get him convicted. Henry's questioning of the victims at trial was aggressive and his defense was extremely poor. He suggested to the victims that he believed they had never been assaulted and that they had falsely constructed a story, which was traumatic for the victims and startling to the jury. A defense argument would have been significantly more effective with the advice of a competent lawyer. It appears there was also significant judicial bias at trial. The trial judge, Justice Bouk, showed disdain for the defendant during the trial, and whether purposefully or not, he did not mention to Henry the option for amicus curiae, a court-appointed lawyer that can offer an informed legal opinion. As of 2009, Justice Bouk denied any failure on his part. According to the National Post, he stated, Trials are conducted and decided by imperfect human beings applying imperfect laws. The most the criminal justice system can offer is a fair trial. Mr. Henry got both a fair trial and a fair dangerous offender hearing. He also said that any lack of fairness was the result of fault on Henry's part. However, had Henry been better aware of all of his options for counsel, he could have made a more informed decision. In addition to not informing Henry of the option for amicus curiae, the BC Court of Appeals suggested Justice Bouk made further errors. For one, he should have severed the counts against Henry or declared a mistrial. The jury needed to consider the evidence of each count separately, but this would be almost impossible in a joint trial. It is inevitable that the jury would be influenced by the fact that there are multiple similar charges against the same defendant. This propensity reasoning causes prejudice towards the defendant and renders the trial unfair. Justice Bouk also made a poor instruction to the jury about Henry's resistance to the original lineup. Crown prosecutors suggested at trial that resisting a lineup was evidence of consciousness of guilt. However, case law states that the evidentiary effect of refusal to participate in a lineup is admissible in court but can have no bearing on guilt or innocence. There was a failure of the trial judge to remind the jury of alternative explanations for resistance to the lineup. Lastly, throughout the trial, Justice Bouk made inappropriate reference to Henry as the attacker. Although this is a subtle mistake, it likely biased the jury's view of Henry. The compound effect of an unpopular defendant, poor judicial practice, and inadequate defense made it an easy decision for the jury to convict Henry. Evaluating the overall fairness of the trial, it is evident that proper disclosure was also an issue. The prosecution failed to disclose 27 important oral and written victim statements to police. Physical evidence, including bodily fluids, was obtained, but not shown in court. By the time DNA technology was developed, the evidence had been lost. This means that Ivan Henry can never be cleared by DNA evidence. The defense and the jury was unaware of the existence of alternative suspects, such as Don McRae, or the occurrence of similar assaults during times which Henry was either under surveillance or in jail. All of this information has come into the open since the trial. 
Had it been available to the defendant at the time, the jury may not have been able to find Henry guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The investigation of Ivan Henry started off with substantial public pressure to find the perpetrator. Marginalization made Henry an easy target for police and an unpopular defendant in court. Tunnel vision led to an ineffective police investigation, which included the use of an unreliable paid informant and faulty lineup procedures. Police, prosecutors, and the jury believed in questionable eyewitness testimony. At the trial, there was inadequate defense counsel as well as judicial bias and error. The Crown also did not make proper disclosure. Each of these factors made a significant contribution to the miscarriage of justice that is Ivan Henry's conviction. Although Henry was acquitted in 2010, he is not fully exonerated, meaning he has not been declared factually innocent. Since the appeal, Ivan Henry has filed civil lawsuits against the Provincial and Federal Attorneys General, the City of Vancouver, and three members of its police department. The lawsuits concern malicious prosecution, abuse of process, misfeasance in public office, and an award for charter damages for what he states were egregious breaches of the Crown's disclosure obligations. The trial is set for August 2015. Many victims and some of the Vancouver police still believe in Ivan Henry's guilt. They argue that Henry did actually commit one or more of the assaults and therefore is not entitled to damages, stating that he was not properly convicted rather than wrongfully convicted. It is safe to say that the victims in this ordeal, including Ivan Henry himself, will almost certainly never have a sense of justice or finality. Although the entire process has lasted over three decades so far, Ivan Henry has maintained his innocence from day one. He stated to CTV News recently, I'll always have those senses of disrespect, of being framed, you know, that kind of thing. It will never go away. Never, as long as I live. Even on my dying bed, I'll tell you the story. I didn't do it.